Hey guys, in this week's episode, Justin and I welcome friend of the show, Matt Ward, and he's going to list his top 10 films of all time. But before that, we're going to talk about, for your consideration, Capone and movie theaters, COVID-19, how it's affecting the movie industry, amongst other things. So join us. Hello and welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Justin. Normally you'd be hearing Chris right now with doing this introduction, but he is not with us again this week. I guess he's off sipping margaritas or doing something luxurious, I'm sure. <laughs> but with us is normal and regular host, Mike. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I am excellent. Thank you for asking. Mm, you're welcome. And we also have with us a guest, a uh, returning guest. I think this is, his, is this your third time on the show, Matt? This is my third time being someone's understudy. There, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But yes, Matt Ward uh, from the uh, Cinematic Considerations uh, Review uh, website. Is it a website or a blog? It, it's it's both. So I review, uh, I review movies both online for Rotten Tomatoes and for my personal website, but also my reviews are uh, appear each week in the Fredericksburg Standard newspaper. So I am the official film critic of of note for the Texas Hill Country. Pretty cool. Yeah. Very nice. Jealous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if this is your first time listening to the show, this is a special episode um, that we started recently during the pandemic where uh, we pick someone and go over in detail their top 10 films of all time. We've already done Chris, Justin, and myself, which are the three regular hosts, but Matt Ward, friend of the show, and beloved movie critic, a professional note. Uh, we wanted to hear his top 10 films as well. So, covering for Chris today, we have Matt. Uh First, we're going to do news on the march. Then we'll go ahead and move into his top 10 films. Yeah, that's right. And if you want to follow along with everything we're doing, let us know what you think of Matt's top 10s. Or if you go back and listen to any of our top 10s, let us know what you think of them. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. You can also email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already and you like the show, you want to help other people find it, go on to iTunes, give us a five star review. Also, if whatever podcast platform you're using has a rating system, give us five star stars on there too. Yeah. It couldn't Assuming hurt. five is the maximum. Yeah, that's true. Good point. If it's, if it's 25 stars, you give us 25. That's right. Or 57 stars. Yeah. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys, are we ready to go ahead and get into news on the March? Yeah, absolutely. Let's March. You on the March. Do you want me to go first since I'm listed first or? Uh, you know, uh, you made the notes. You put your name first. It seems like you had an agenda when you asked me that question. So <laughs> it seems like a leading question. I feel like I'm in between a married couple bickering about grocery lists. Oh, no, that wasn't bickering. Oh, yeah. That's banter, sir. Oh, witty banter. Yeah. It's witty yeah. banter. Yeah. It's like a Christopher Guest movie. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's funny that you say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I will go first uh, this week. I just wanted to talk very quickly about a comedy film. One I've been meaning to watch for a long time uh, because I'm a big fan of the writer, director, actors, movies. And that is Christopher guests for your consideration. Ooh, have either hey. of you guys seen this film? I have not. This is like, I think one of the main Christopher guest movies that I have not seen. I have seen for your consideration, but it's been a very long time. Cool. So this kind of ties in with some stuff I think we'll be talking about later and, and with Matt being a film critic. So it's kind of a fortuitous. It also ties in with me finishing finishing um, Shit's Creek last week and talking about that on last week's episode. I was hungry for some more, you know, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara type comedy. Wait, so, sidebar question. Yes. Before this before this uh, leaves my mind. Was there any Christopher Guest in uh, presence uh, in Shit's Creek? None at all. That's disappointing. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I, I watched his last movie, Mascots, that was a Netflix movie, and that was disappointing as well, so maybe yeah. it's for the best. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, 
Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara are in it. Basically, all of Christopher Guest's like usual uh, cast of people are in this. And the reason it ties in so well um, with Matt and being a movie critic is For Your Consideration is about a movie that's being made uh, starring Catherine O'Hara. Catherine O'Hara plays like the leading actress and Mm -hmm. she stumbles across a rumor on the internet that uh, has her um, getting some Oscar buzz, some early Oscar buzz for her performance. (laughs) And that slowly trickles out to the rest of the cast um, as the rumor kind of builds and everybody kind of gets, you know, wrapped up in trying to like make this movie and win their Oscar and everything that goes along with like the pressure of potentially being nominated for an Oscar. And they're all kind of getting excited about this before there's any real news other than just internet rumors, basically. Right. Um, And it's, it's really funny. I think that it's, it's definitely up there for me with like uh, a mighty wind and best in show. Yeah. Uh, But I love best in show. Yeah, Best in Show is really good. I, for me, like I, I don't think he's topped Waiting for Guffman. Yeah, I think Best in Show and Waiting for Guffman are my favorites. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I could see this one being a little below that, but it's still it's very funny. It's a little bit less mockumentary than some of his other ones. It sounds funny. The plot, uh, like I didn't know what it was about, and what you just described sounds funny to me. Yeah, yeah. I think we we would all be interested in and most and most people listening to this podcast would be interested because it is takes place in Hollywood in the movie world and there's Oscar talk and like uh, parodies of like Entertainment Tonight <laughs> type shows right. and uh, Christopher Guest is is really great he's not a ton, like a super main character in the film but he plays like a sort of a cranky like blase old Jewish Hollywood director <laughs> and he's super funny in it. <laughs> he's maybe may, may the only person like involved with the movie that isn't really concerned about the Oscar buzz and just kind of not just kind of a really even keel the whole time, which is funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to recommend that because anybody who likes movies, anybody who enjoys a good comedy, I think will really like this movie. Yeah. I'm actually going to have to look into this soon because that plot sounds great to me actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard what it was about a few years ago and I was like, why have I not watched this yet? This is the Christopher Guest movie that would appeal to me most. I don't care yeah. about dog shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love dogs, but I hate those dog shows. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it it'll be up all of our alleys. Do you remember liking it, Matt? Yeah, no, absolutely. I do I definitely remember liking Please, it. No, it sucks. No. I no, not at all. No, these these movies are fun. It's it, it kind of reminded me of like an elevated version of like the Ernest P. Worrell movies, just in terms of like stylistically that kind of just like super dry humor that you don't mm-hmm. really ever uh, expect to enjoy. Uh, but the more that you get into it, the more that you enjoy it. My personal favorite in these movies has always been Fred Willard. I just really identify with his humor um, in, in these he's movies. Awesome. Yeah, it's Fred. Yeah. And he he's now recently no longer with us, if I remember correctly. Um, so it yeah, is, it's right. always a, it's always a good time to to go back and, and check in on uh, on on films from from some of the some of the greats. And we'll be we'll be doing that a little bit of that here in a little bit with a different uh, actor uh, in my top 10 list. Nice. Ooh. Yeah, I will say that if you enjoy Fred Willard, go back and revisit this one because he, he is one of the best parts of this movie as he is. You know, anytime he shows up in any of these films, you know, but there's yeah. he's one of the hosts of the fake parody of Entertainment Tonight. And uh, it's it's really good. Everything he does is just like making me laugh out loud. So definitely recommend. Perfect. I will be checking that out this weekend for sure. Awesome. Well, that is it for me for this week. So, uh, Mike, what do you have? Yeah, so I will keep this brief. I have um, finally caught another new movie from 2020. Um, And I wanted to talk about it, even though uh, it's got... Pretty mixed reviews out there right now. Um, do I'm those talking exist? About- movies from 2020? New movies from 2020? Yeah, I, I do. I watch them every week, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you have to seek them out. But um, So I found one that um, I knew was going to be a gamble. I knew I probably wouldn't love it, no matter what. right? And I watched um, Capone, starring Tom Hardy. And uh, have either of you guys seen Capone? Oh yes. I, how can you not? Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, how can you not go and try to seek out another Josh Trank disaster film? <laughs> uh, I'll tell well, you how you you don't because that's what I've done. <laughs> well, Josh Trank is the reason I actually wanted to see it. Um, because I enjoyed Chronicle. Yeah. I thought Chronicle was a very strong 
first movie. Oh, I did not know that he did that or was the same director because I also like Chronicle. Yeah, Chronicle's quite good, I think. And then uh, we all know about the Fantastic Four. But the thing is, the Fantastic Four was such a mess that I wasn't completely sure it was Josh Trank's fault. Or at least I don't know the full story, right? I've never seen his director's cut. I've only seen the the butchered version from the studio. So I wanted to see like the third film from Josh Trank um, just to kind of see like what he could do if he's like in charge of a movie. And I got to say, this is um, a really strange choice to make this movie. Uh, it's a movie about Al Capone in the last year of his life after like the syphilis has pretty much taken over his brain uh, and he's just basically deteriorating and falling apart. And it's not your traditional like Al Capone movie. There's no, you know, mob shootouts. There's no, you know, beating people up. There's none of the tradition. There's not Goodfellas or anything like that. You know, it's not untouchables. So I guess the the thing that baffles me about this movie is that have you ever seen um Gus Van Zandt's Last Days? I have, yes. I have not. Okay. So it reminds me of that movie kind of. It's like a movie mm. that just kind of wallows in misery. Yeah. For the entire runtime. Like and the thing about this movie is like it's all from his perspective. Like he's walking around his house going crazy. Uh, Cause he's got dementia and his family is just kind of trying to take care of him. And then Tom Hardy gives this bizarre performance, which is pretty part of the course, I guess for Tom Hardy at this point. Yeah. But man, I don't know. Uh, Matt, you've seen it. What are your thoughts on this movie? So, I mean, obviously right off the bat, it makes me appreciate the Irishman even more as a film <laughs> um, because yeah. it approaches a lot of the same general themes uh, from a different angle. Uh, yeah, and I, I honestly love Tom Hardy in this movie for the most part. Um, yeah, you know, I think I do too. It, it's a performance that he's really going for it because he, he does not care at all. No, I mean, when he gets <laughs> no, the, he doesn't, and he gets that from Josh Trank, a, a director who does not care. He he knows that you're gonna think he think he shit the bed, and he's gonna literally say shit the bed in the movie. You know Man, that scene. Oh my god. It's, it, I didn't see that coming. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the, what to tell you the, any more than that one, other than just like, yeah, I, I was watching it and I was like, did he just shit the bed? And then like his wife wakes up like Linda Cardellini, you know, and then like she lifts up the covers and she's like, just reacts exactly how a human being would react if someone shit the bed next to you. Absolutely. And and it's just a bizarre scene. But also it's 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 not fun to watch, but I didn't hate it. To be honest with you, no, I don't I, love it. Like I said, but it, I think there's some stuff here. It's certainly um, nothing I will ever revisit again. That's that's no, for sure. No, 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 but not at all. It's not the worst movie to come out in 2020. It just isn't. No, it's actually I think it's quite bold and and daring in a couple of places. Yeah, um, absolutely. I let's put it this way. I am more excited to see what Josh Trink would do will do next time. Yeah. Like I am gen I hope this is not the end of his career because this movie came out with like um mixed reviews because the thing is, I feel like he made an inaccessible movie on purpose. Yeah. So uh, you know, I don't want people to write this off as like a failure, but man, it is not fun, but it's interesting. Yeah. A purposely inaccessible movie sounds like Gus Van Sant's last days. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. even Elephant. Oh man! Yeah, it's it's better than, in my opinion, it's better than either of those movies. But I think that's pretty controversial because I know those movies have their fans. Uh, I I don't like Elephant, but I, I did enjoy Last Days. Well, then watch this, man. I think you might actually get some enjoyment out of it. Okay. Now I am am moved to watch it. I thought when we started this that it was going to be a don't watch this movie. It's not great, but now here I mean it's I am not great to watch it. It's not great, but it's well, not. It's not, not a great. train wreck, and it's it's more interesting than it is not, in my opinion. Yeah, not great in the ne negative sense, in the trying to be nice. Yeah, you know, way. it's just not a movie that like I could ever recommend to anyone, except for like the people on this podcast and maybe Chris. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what he's doing right now. He's not on the podcast, so he can watch Capone. Oh <laughs> yep, yeah, priorities, I guess. Yeah, I recommended it to him last night, so he just decided to 
make that his priority today. He's like, guys, I got to get off the podcast. <laughs> Okay. But anyways, that's all I really wanted to say about Capone other than it exists. It's weird. Um, Tom Hardy really goes for it. But yeah, I I can't say that you're going to have a good time watching it. Fair and enough. you might also think it's terrible. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. So that's about it. Matt. Yes. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in this pandemic right now sure. with your... Your job and your industry. Well, I can. You said that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, you, we just kind of mentioned earlier that twenty twenty films are uh, hard to come by. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I was going to jump off of what we were saying about Capone. I feel like uh, Mike. I don't know if this pertains to you as well, but for me, like, I appreciate Capone more because my overall expectations for films in twenty twenty are lower, uh, just in generally. <laughs> Uh, because yeah. the, the the bar is being constantly set lower and lower uh, because all of the good movies, hopefully, cross your fingers that uh, yeah, were slated to come out at this point, are be the ones that are that are good enough that they want to make money on the studios want to make money on. Mm-hmm. They're holding those back, and so we're getting yeah. a lot of the movies where it's like, oh, this is it's okay that we can release this now, um, and so we're getting a lot of those. Um, luckily, there's been enough good independent content and other films that have kind of that were already slated to hit streaming services at about this point in time like to five bloods like shirley mm-hmm. like blow the man down uh, a lot of those films that have already kind of seen their time come and go through the theatrical system or at least enough of the theatrical system that we have some good content um for for the for the early part of the summer uh, it's it's different. It's difficult for me every week. You know, I always, especially when it came to writing for the newspaper, uh, they really wanted me to focus on films that people in the town could actually go and see at the local movie theater. Well, now the local yeah. movie theater is shut down. And now in Texas, all the movie theater theaters, for the most part, are shut down, or at least they're not playing anything that has come out in 2020. They're doing classic titles of some variation or another. Um, But I'm having to move to streaming services for the most part. Occasionally I will find a hidden gem on Redbox where somebody could go and rent on Redbox or uh, possibly if there's something that I really feel might be worth $20 to rent digitally, I might do that. But I'm trying to veer away from that uh, because of the, the ease of access uh, while hitting a variety of different things. So that's why I've forced myself to to sit through things like Artemis Fowl and My Spy, <laughs> um, while also like going back and taking a look at films like The Rhythm Section or Emma, which I absolutely adored, or trying to get people in small town America to see more independent films like Blow the Man Down, as I said, or, or Shirley, which is an absolutely terrific uh, Elizabeth Moss performance. Uh, in yeah. what I think is one of the year's best films. Cool. Yeah, I've been um, waiting for Shirley. I'm excited to see that. Yeah, no, it's it's out on Hulu now, and I highly recommend uh, checking that out. It's it's terrific. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, yeah, and you had mentioned something off air about uh, the, some film festivals and you were like a lot of film festivals sure. are going online and you're potentially getting into some of them. It's a little easier. Do you want to talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So I'll start out by saying, so one of the things that I do as a, as another side gig, uh, besides doing film criticism is I'm a film programmer for two film festivals, uh, the Hill country film festival, which occurs every, uh, early late April, early May in Fredericksburg. And then the Lone Star film festival, which is a film festival in Fort Worth that happens uh, every November. And uh, we were in the middle of planning the t- 11th annual Hill Country Film Festival when COVID all started. And so we had to move to an online format for our film festival this year, which was a pain and crazy and didn't quite, you know, meet what we wanted to do because we were trying so hard that this was right in the time where we thought it was possible to still have a yeah. film festival. And so we were pushing and pushing and pushing. And not that we that it would had move into online was bad. It just it it felt like a letdown for after all the hard work that we'd put in and how all the hard work that all these small independent filmmakers put in trying to get to the point where they could have their film hit film festivals in 2020. 
But Mm -hmm. the good thing about that is a lot of the major festivals are easing the access for wider audiences to see their content uh, without leaving their homes. Uh, South by Southwest this year partnered with the Amazon uh, to release, uh, think about 15 to 20 of their 100 plus selection of films at their slate online digitally for free for anyone to check out. Um, and a lot of the, the the bigger film festivals like Toronto International Film Festival, which is a festival I personally have always wanted to go to because it's where all the Oscar contenders kind of debut. And even Sundance, they're looking at uh, ways to, to have an online presence in terms of their actual screening of content um, because of COVID. So that's opening up some opportunities, hopefully, knock on wood for me, to uh, get some press credentials and attend the film festival without leaving my house, which, which is as a smaller film critic uh, is a, just like a gold mine to me to be able to see things early. Yeah. Yeah. That that sounds super awesome. I I love going to the theater and and film festivals are super fun. I've been to both Hill country and Lone Star and they were super great times and watching a ton of movies was great, but there's something I also enjoy about being able to just stay home and watch movies and not have to worry about, you know, anybody being rude or talking or whatever, which I have run into in film festivals, not that often, not as often as a regular theater. Right. Um, but I do like watching things from home quite a bit. It's, it's convenient and that's nice, especially if it's something that was going to be playing at Sundance, which is, you know, a long way away from us and uh, expensive to go do. <laughs> Yeah. And speaking of Sundance, the one last thing that I will say really quickly is that, you know, with the Academy uh, moving their uh, calendar for eligibility uh, for the awards this year, where films that release in January and February of 2021 are eligible, uh, this really could revolutionize uh, independent films chances at the Academy Awards, because uh, if those films that are going to be playing at the 2021 uh, Sundance Film Festival now become eligible to uh, for Academy Award consideration for that year, um, that could instantly put a movie could debut at Sundance, immediately go into the voting and be right at the front of the line in terms of word of mouth that could really propel propel a strong independent film uh, from Sundance to, to go and, and hit it big uh, at the Oscars. Yeah, it's good because that buzz is like fresh and it doesn't have to wait until a whole year for Oscars to come around and hopefully still have the buzz, right? And that's what basically yeah. what you're Absolutely. saying. It's, it's, it's why traditionally all of the best films of the year come out between October and December. Um, they have to hit a certain window of time where they're released theatrically uh, to be eligible and they're trying to get it as late as humanly possible so that people are still talking about those movies fresh in your, their minds uh, when they're when the actual voters are voting on nominations and then later on the actual awards themselves. It's an interesting perspective. I wonder if that's something that will stick. Do, does it feel at all to you guys like one of those things that like what kind of once you push the button, it's hard to undo? Maybe. It depends on how much of a hit it is, I guess, how it goes this year. I was going to say, I think it'll be a progressive change. I think the that overall studios are going to want to, hypothetically, if we are able within the next... 18 months to put COVID behind us and get back to relative normalcy in our movie going experience. I think studios are going to want to get a lot of those Oscar contending films back in that October to December range where there's a lot of holidays and and viewership is up traditionally uh, in terms of the time of year. So you might see a scaling of that system where uh, maybe next year their films are eligible through the end of January and then you push it back a couple of weeks that for 2022 and then try to get mm-hmm. it back where it kind of staggers its way back. So you're not jumping as far and you're kind of gradually pushing that process backwards. Well, cool. It's interesting to have your perspective on like the COVID thing because as just people who go to the movie theaters and that's it, <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it certainly affects us, but uh, you're obviously a lot more affected in both negative and positive ways, really. Absolutely. It's a it's a mixed bag. I always feel like I'm on a roller coaster, uh, especially when it comes to major releases, because uh, you try to pencil in like when Tenet is coming out. Uh, so I got to kind of figure out how when do I need to start rewatching all of my Christopher Nolan movies to prepare for Tenet? 
Or uh, one of the things, one of the long-term projects I'm working on for Cinematic Considerations is a complete uh, retrospective review of the entire James Bond film series uh, that I would, oh my. Had, that I had planned to come out uh, leading up to No Time to Die, but that film's gotten pushed back to November, so it's given me a little bit more time to work on it. Uh, but it's hard as 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 a, as a critic to kind of figure out what's next on the game plan. I know what I'm going to be reviewing uh, for this weekend, and then beyond that, I have no idea. Well, to keep you on your toes for sure, yeah. definitely keep you always looking around. <laughs> All right, well. I guess uh, good luck with everything going forward with this, Matt. I hope that uh, it opens up soon and you're able to like uh, start penciling in new releases easier without having to constantly wonder uh, when Tenet's going to get pushed back again. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, are we ready to go ahead and get into Matt's top 10 films of all time? Let's do it. Yeah, Matt's the one who has to answer that question, and he sounds ready. Yeah, he, he does sound ready. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, Matt, now is the time. We gave you, what, like three days notice? Two I, days notice? Yeah, I've been working on this a little bit longer than that, but yeah. <laughs> you you always have the top 10 films in your back pocket ready to go. No, I, I started really preparing this list when I heard that y'all were gonna interested in possible uh, people to come on and guest and do this, honestly. Nice. All right, yeah. good. Well, I'm glad we didn't... Uh, put you on a time crunch because i certainly took longer than three days to prepare my top 10 films of all time list and i still might go back and make changes if i had more time so um why don't you go ahead and kick us off with your number 10 sure uh i, I want to do a little bit of a, of a preamble if i could beforehand and just kind of say that i uh, i know that y'all went ahead and did your favorite films versus like top 10 of all time um so these films that i'm going to kind of do are probably for me my most favorite films to rewatch. Uh there are films that are higher on this list that I've seen once or maybe twice and I'm good not having to seen that again, you know, anymore mm -hmm. that I just I respect more as films, but these film these 10 films to me are ones that I will constantly rewatch. They're my favorites personally to me. Um it's not necessarily something I would recommend necessarily to to you Mike or to to Justin or to Chris, but, or, but the, for me, these are my sure. personal top 10 favorite films of all time and don't necessarily reflect like an overall best, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of how we had to frame it too with ours. Uh, so I apologize for no, saying good. top 10 films of all time. Matt's personal top 10 films. That works. <laughs> that, 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 that works. I just wanted to do a small clarification. Yeah. yeah. I, I hear you. No, I hear you. No problem. We're with you. No, we're perfect. following you. I respect it. And, and I have to and I have to admit, I've been moving things around on my list all day for like the past three days. And uh, about mm -hmm. three hours before we recorded this podcast, I realized that one of the films that had to be on my list was not on my list at all. Um, and so mm -hmm. I had to go back and remove <laughs> some stuff around. Um, so. All right. So we're going to start with number 10. Um, and I talked earlier about uh, getting into Christopher Nolan films. And so I'm going to start with Christopher Nolan uh, here at number 10. This is a film that. I saw in theaters, uh, I want to say at least five times. It took me two or three times watching it in IMAX to completely fully get how much I loved this movie, both visually and just from understanding this damn story because it's so strange and there's so many layers to it. Um, and I know this is kind of a highly controversial film within the, within the, the Christopher Nolan canon, but my number 10 film is Inception. Uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, nice. Tom Hardy, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Ellen Page, uh, Michael Caine, who's in every Christopher Nolan movie. Uh, one of the things that I truly love about Inception is just how, for so much of the, two, the 2000s, uh, Inception came out in 2010, for so much of the 2000s, everything kind of felt cookie cutter, almost, in filmmaking. You, you, we're starting to get the sequelization that kind of becomes rampant in the 2010s. Um, but Inception kind of was a firm stamp in the ground for I can make a big budget action filled movie that's completely original filmmaking with 
styles that you're not going to see anywhere else. And it was just like Christopher Nolan sealing his stamp saying, I am here as a major film mm-hmm. director. Um, and I've been a big fan of his uh, throughout all of his career. I, I love everything from Memento, which I think was Chris's number two movie all the way through the prestige. Um, I'm a big fan of the Batman trilogy that, uh, that Christopher Nolan did, but what sticks out mm-hmm. to me about inception is just both both the the charisma that the the performers have on the screen i think this is the best acted of any christopher nolan movie to date uh just between Mm -hmm. tom hardy being five people at once uh with how he has to (laughs) where he has to kind of mimic tom berenger in this movie and mimic other people and just be snarky uh and then dicaprio giving such a layered performance uh in the role it's the it's definitely the best acted and then Chris Corbold's uh, visual uh, special effects that he does to to make some of the uh, bombastic, audacious action sequences that you see in Inception is just incredible. Um, there's a there's a iconic scene in a hallway where Joseph Gordon Levitt is fighting a random bad guy, and it, oh, the, man, the yeah. whole world kind of spins in a circle. Um, and I don't know if oh, you, man. I don't know if yeah. you've ever seen uh, the behind the scenes or how they did that. But essentially, they created a set in a box and rotated the box around so that the fight choreography could continue while the camera is still following all of the action to kind of create that. And it's just the the visual mastery. Right. So that that's that's Inception for me. It's just one of those big, audacious, bombastic action films that's authentically strange and original. Yeah, I agree completely with what you're saying right here this is my favorite christopher nolan film personally yeah um i i don't know if in my brain he's ever going to top this movie which is fine with me um i think this movie is absolutely wonderful and speaking of the hallway fight you mentioned yeah uh do you remember when the first teaser trailer came out for inception yes and it was just like just like one or two shots of that fight of like joseph gordon levitt running on the walls and then like and then the ceiling yeah and then running towards that dude and that's all the teaser trailer really was. And I remember um, I was in film school at the time. And I remember everyone was like, what the hell is this movie about? Yeah. Like that teaser trailer got people pumped because it looked different. It was original filmmaking. Like, it, I mean, yeah, there's special effects like CGI in there and stuff like that. But like Joseph Gordon-Levitt was running on the wall in a suit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like what could possibly be the context you know and so not since maybe the matrix have have i ever seen a movie personally like a science fiction like action movie get the crowd that excited and enthusiastic about it right and what i love and going back to that teaser trailer the other part of the teaser trailer that's so iconic in my mind is Ellen Page and DiCaprio walking down the street in that French neighborhood and the the neighborhood basically flipping over on top of itself where the buildings are like stacking on top of themselves and just like the artistry to see like what cinema can be. um, Right. I remember I saw this. I remember I saw this opening night. Yep. I think I like I went home and got my roommate at the time. His name is Brian. Shout out to Brian Wilde. And I was like, dude, we have to see this movie. You have to see this movie. And then I went back, like, I think either later that day or the next day and saw it twice, like twice in a row. Mike, I have to ask, how many times did you need to watch Inception before you understood what was going on? Oh, uh, I understood what was going on the whole time the first time, I believe. Even with all the layers Uh, of all the dreams? Yeah, the but that, but like, I, at least I remember keeping up with it. I don't remember being like, what the hell's going on? But I remember like an hour into it being like, this movie's not talking down to me. Like this movie's like not holding my hand. Like, yep, I'm into this, right? And then I I just remember like halfway through that movie, the the feeling like when they're on the heist. Yeah, right. I think it's like uh, when the van's falling. That's what that's when it's all happening, mm-hmm. right? Like whenever like you get to the scene and like the van's falling, and then you zoom out to another one, and then and then another one, and everything like that. Yeah, and it's just going layers upon layers. And I remember thinking like, this is nuts. Yeah. Like, th- it's so outside like, at the time it was so like out, outside of the box. Right. And I, I remember having to draw all the different layers of a dream on a napkin 
to explain to people <laughs> that I would go with, like where everything was. All right, so now we're yeah, here. Yeah, I tried to show my dad here. and he didn't yeah. respond to this movie at all. <laughs> and, it, and it really disappointed me. I was like really like crestfallen. Yeah, I, I like think I, I remember understanding the movie. I think that there were a couple of things that kind of confused me just in terms of logically how things worked more right. so than I didn't really understand what they were doing. Right. Um, I, I, I don't really want to spoil it, but it is things that happen, you know, at the very end, basically like that third act, like let's figure out and solve the problem or attempt to solve the problem with one last like go. That's yeah. what I'll say. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And although I don't remember being confused, confused, I remember thinking like before the movie was even over, I was like, I got to see this again tomorrow. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I think even if you're not confused or whatever by it, um, there's a lot, there's a lot to catch up on and yeah. find on uh, repeat viewings. There's it's it's a very very dense movie with a lot of layers, so it's like it it continues to reward ending. me. Even I think I watched it about a year ago. Yeah, and nice. It it perfectly held up, and I was finding things and noticing stuff I never noticed, and I've probably seen that movie seven eight times now. Yeah, I haven't seen it in a few years, but I still. Um, I still have an opinion on the end. Yeah. I still like think I know what happens at the end and I think I know where it starts <laughs> to happen at. And, and it's all so cool and it's all so neat. And, and the ending is so freaking good. Right. Like I remember when it was over and it cuts to black and I won't say what happens, but it cuts to black. And I remember like the audience moaned. Yep. But then some of them were like, yeah, you know, it was like a really, like everyone was engaged though. Like everyone had a visceral, like emotional response to that ending. And that's a, that's an ending. Yeah. Yeah. Something that can just get people worked up. All right. Are, are we ready to move on to number nine? Yeah. Yeah. Go All for right. it. Perfect. So I know listening to your podcasts uh, for a long time and I listen to your top 10 lists that you, you go deeper back into uh, the archives of cinema than I typically do. So this is going to be the oldest film on my list. It comes from the mid '70s, from 1976, um, and it is the film. So when I went into uh, film criticism, I had already been a, a reporter uh, for the newspaper that I now write uh, film columns for. I'd been a reporter there for, cool. for five or six years at least uh, at that point, and this film really kind of cemented my love for journalism, um, and that kind of probably uh, spoils it. Uh, it's a uh, Alan J. Pakula's uh, 1976 masterpiece, "All the President's Men." with Robert Redford ah. and Dustin Hoffman. Um, it's the perfect film in terms of like examining political intrigue and drama while keeping the big, bad monster presence out of the film. It's one of the things I love about All the President's Men is that Nixon is a, a shadow of uh, that, that kind of haunts the film where you don't, you hear his voice and you see him through a, a shaded window, but you never like, there's no person playing Nixon on screen and he doesn't ever combatively yell uh, at a reporter or do anything like that. It's all about the espionage and the uncovering of investigative journalism that Carl uh, Bernstein and Bob Woodward do in the film. Uh, that That's so incredible. Um, and I guess I should, as an aside, say this is the, the, the retelling of the uh, uncovering of the Washington Post's revelations into the Watergate scandal in the in the in the 60s. Uh, in early 70s. And it's just a phenomenal film. I think Robert Redford and, and Dustin Hoffman are perfect together. They both add uh, something unique to the film that's kind of almost odd couple bantery, where, but they work really, mm -hmm. really well together um, and kind of balance each other fo so fantastically. And it's, if I don't know if either one of you have seen this recently, like, but I remember growing up the first couple times I watched it, it was one of the scariest movies I'd ever seen because all of the <laughs> underground stuff that Pakula does where uh, Woodward goes to meet his uh, contacts in these like hidden mm -hmm. garages is set late at night and it's so dark and scary and there's all this haunting music and the way that he stages all that is just so perfect. It, it, it was really intense. And like, I still sometimes will get chills knowing what's happened because I've seen the movie more than a dozen times, but like, oh my gosh, somebody is after Woodward. Like they're, they're right behind him. Um, and it's that that's right. just an incredible feat of old school filmmaking that I just really love. Have either one of you yeah, seen I this Yeah, I actually film? have not seen this movie since I was like, okay. uh, probably 19 or 20. Yeah. I've only seen it one time. 
Oof. Yeah, that's. I think we watched it around the same time, if not at the exact same time with each other. So that was the last time I saw it as well. But um, yeah, no, I this movie's wonderful. It's like one of the classic movies, right? Uh, you've For seen sure. this movie, even if you haven't seen the movie, you've seen it spoofed somewhere or mentioned. Absolutely. Well, and it, it's it's the basis for every investigative journalism movie ever since. Like it is how oh, yeah. Spotlight works. It's how one of mm-hmm. my other favorite uh, journalism movies, State of Play, a film nobody likes except for me. Oh man, I like that movie. Do the you? one with okay, Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe and Ben Affleck. I love that movie. Yeah, yeah it yeah, was. Yeah. It's on my honorable mentions list. State of Play is terrific. Um, but yeah, I always thought the movie was good too. And I remember when it came out, and everyone started shitting on it. And I remember being like, "Are they watching the same movie as I am?" <laughs> no, I love State of Play. Yeah. I own that movie. It's fantastic. Doesn't that movie end with Creedence Clearwater Revival playing? Yes, it does. And yep, I and, remember that. And it and it starts out with uh, Russell Crowe uh, hung over driving to a murder scene uh, while some Irish jig song is playing. And I just remember listening obsessively to that Irish jig song because it's so hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember that's uh, I remember it ended with uh, put a candle in the window. Yeah, credence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, which they're, is an underrated song. While if you ask me while they're um, making the day's paper and sending it out. So you get the process of like actually seeing how a paper is printed and then shipped out from a major newspaper. Yeah. That's an, that's a, yeah. that's a but, really but anyway, underrated movie. Yeah. All the president's men. I'm sorry. No, it's <laughs> no, but this is, this is part of the point of all the president's men and why it's so good is that it inspired a series of films. And I think quite honestly, given where we're at right now, the way that it approaches politics is going to set a precedent for the way future filmmakers look at the last 20 or 30 years in American political history. You know, yeah, the, it, that makes where, sense where you don't have to uh, focus on the people in, in, in charge or the people in power making the decisions. You focus on the smaller, the smaller people on the fringes. It's it's part of the reason that um, Margot Robbie's character exists in Bombshell, which is a movie that I'm, I'm probably a bigger fan of than most people who have seen that film. But, you know, it this is the this is the the the, the Bible on which all. Uh, journalism movies and a lot of political uh, thriller films are, are set up be- upon. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And what I will say is I would love to go back and watch this movie, but I'm scared it would make me too depressed about the current state of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because that's back that's whenever accurate. journalism could change the world. It's true. And, yeah. you can, and or you can go and knock on doors and shake people's hands and do all that sort of stuff, too. <laughs> Well, cool. Uh, do you you got your number eight? I do. So uh, number eight for me, it, it, it's another one of those films that I feel like is a game changer uh, in terms of the way that films that have come after it have approached the genre. Uh, it's it's my favorite film uh, in this style um, because it's an independent filmmaker who kind of started uh, changing the way that we do traditional action movies. Um, and it's funny that the other film that came out basically within two weeks of this was a big bombastic Tom Clancy, uh, uh, novelization turned into film, uh, that with Ben Affleck that just completely bombed at the movie theaters and this small little indie some of all what again, some of all what again, exactly. Some of all fears technically, but yes. Yeah. I Um, saw that in theaters. I was one of those people who did not help it bomb. Right. Yeah. Good job, Justin. But Thanks. but but what I was gonna say is like that this this small little indie movie created a cult classic that turned into uh, a four four films four, excuse me five films now and has really kind of revolutionized the way that you shoot action sequences in major motion pictures and that's uh, Doug Liman's 2002 classic The Born Identity with Matt Damon and Franca Patente. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, this one I didn't see coming. I absolutely love the Born Identity because it feels very much like a modern film. Uh, you get you get a lot of the, the technological advances, but it has is grounded in in seventies. Um, I don't know uh, how recently y'all have seen it, but like there's a, the, the what strikes me first and foremost about Born Identity when it, we're looking back is there's an action sequence that's just a car chase that kind of evokes like French connection bullet 
as born and uh born and Marie are trying to get away from the Parisian police driving like a little yeah. red mini mini Cooper all over Paris and just the way that it's so kinetic. wasn't that car chase filmed entirely at like 30 miles per hour. Yep. And it's but but it feels so kinetic because yeah. because the camera work is like right there in the car mm-hmm. with 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 Matt Damon and Franco Patente getting the reactions. It wheels around. It starts the handheld revolution like you watch that movie now and you're like, oh, I've seen this a thousand times because everybody mm-hmm. is copying what Doug Lyman did in Born Identity that Paul Greengrass kind of expanded on in Born uh, Supremacy and Born Ultimatum, that kind of kinetic, frantic, in-your-face, handheld style. But if you look at it, you know, kind of a little more holistically, this is a terse, old-school spy drama thriller with a terrific ensemble cast. The villains in this movie are Brian Cox and Chris Cooper. Like, that's that's incredible. Like, Clive Owen has a really small part as an assassin, and he's ju- he just delivers, like, a killer ending monologue to his to his scenes in the film. Uh, Franca Patente from Run Lola Run is incredible in this movie. Uh, the chemistry that she's able to 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 get with with Matt Damon uh, it just so quickly. But where there where there's some tension because they don't trust each other and that kind of all floats away uh, as they as they're on the run together and it comes back and it's it's like a rubber band that they're pulling a, apart and together. Uh, the, how their how their chemistry and their relationship kind of evolves over the film, and just still kicks a lot of ass and has still some of my favorite action sequences of the last century, or excuse me, at least since to- two thousand. At least there's the whole the whole scene in the American Embassy in in, in Switzerland that's absolutely fantastic. Um, it, the the fight scene that he has in the apartment in Paris, like there's there's so many uh, different like iconic moments from the born identity that makes it like my favorite spy action film. Yeah. I have not seen this movie since I think I was gearing up to go see the born ultimatum. Yeah. I watched born identity and board supremacy and then, and then ultimatum in theaters. And I remember it being the best of the trilogy and enjoying it the most, but it's also one that like you said, has been copied over and over again. Then it has waned my interest in revisiting the film, but maybe I should. Right. And it, yeah, I was about to say, Oh no, I was going to say that's exactly right. Like it's going to feel like you've seen this movie a bunch of times before, but that's just because you've been watching action movies that have come out since 2002. Yeah. I was going to say, I first saw this film, um, uh, when I was in ninth grade. Yeah. Uh, and you know, at the time I, I, I appreciate well-filmed action. Like I always have, I think on this podcast, I probably mentioned that the most, I, I like a good, well put together action movie. This movie at the time, I remember, uh, I it, I liked it, but I didn't love it. And now I'm wondering, because I, I have more of like an appreciation of like filmmaking techniques, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if I could go back and really um, look at it again because I like Doug Lyman, yeah, quite a bit, and I like most of what he's done. I, what's the last thing he did? Wasn't it? Ooh. Was it was it Edge of Tomorrow? Yeah. Well, it, he might have done something after that, but the, like Edge of Tomorrow is like the last big, super successful Doug Lyman movie. And yeah. the thing is, it wasn't as successful as it should have been because I think Edge of Tomorrow is a really underrated movie. Absolutely. Movie's so good. I really love that one. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And um, yeah, I would actually really like to go back and watch the original Jason Bourne trilogy. I don't necessarily care about the new two. Uh, yeah. the two newest ones that much. But I would like to give the Bourne trilogy another shot, especially Identity, because I watched um, Supremacy and Ultimatum as they came out in theaters. Yeah. And I didn't go back and rewatch the trilogy at any point. So I've only ever seen the Bourne Identity that one time in like ninth grade. <laughs> and I don't even remember Clive Owen being in it, right? That's before Clive Owen was on my radar. It, it, I don't know what year Children of Men came out, but like it feels 2005. 2005? No, 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 that's not right. No, that's not right. 2007. 2006. Six. So like you're. I don't know why is, I said 2005. This is like leading up to, to Children of Men for Clive Owen, and he's not in it for a lot of the movie, but man, he makes an well, impact. My my first introduction to really knowing who Clive Owen was and knowing his name was Sin City. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was he was the, there next to people like Bruce Willis, who I knew, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was like the one guy that was like kind of like the new face to me. Um, 
But yeah, then Children of Men came out right after that, and then uh, never forgot Clive Owen again. For sure. All right, number seven. All right, I'm only going to back up one year for this, um, and this is a movie Justin was texting me yesterday that I had moved, I was in the process of watching while he was texting me, and I was trying to figure out where it would slide in this list, and it kind of slid up at least two or three spots on a rewatch just because I even forgot just how dynamic visually and just uh, kinetically uh, that this film was. Uh, It's my favorite Steven Soderbergh movie. um, And it's a film where, you know, movie, it's the last film that I really feel like movie stars were allowed to be movie stars and just use their charisma and their name power to just be like, Uh, yes, here we are. This is it. It's Pitt. It's Clooney. It's Damon. I love it. It's Ocean's Eleven from 2001. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. also really like this movie a lot. I rewatched it pretty recently. I think it was after watching Ocean's Eight with my fiance, and she'd never seen any of the other ones. And so uh, I we liked Ocean's Eight all right, but I was like, yeah. eh, maybe we should watch Ocean's Eleven because it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Ocean's Eleven is fantastic just for the way that uh, Soderbergh is able to use the montage so effectively. I, I typically hate montage scenes in movies because they're so poorly put together. They're usually mm-hmm. just overcast over some generic piece of pop music um, and kind of splashed together to yada yada your way through a part of the film that you don't want to explain. But one of my favorite sequences is the entire movie is the 10, 15 minutes that he takes where Clooney and Pitt assemble the entire crew and you see methodically like the backstories on all of these different characters. They give you the basic character intros to people like Bernie Mac, to people like um, Livingston Dell's character, uh, Casey Affleck and Sean uh, Scott Kahn as the, uh, the Utah twin brothers that are, that are, that are badass drivers. And uh, like the, the amazing yen, this movie is so incredibly fun. Like they make, montage is fun again and it it just just does a kinetic energy and everybody is allowed to use just like their natural charms and Soderbergh makes a lot of like great subtle points one of the things I didn't right remember until I rewatched it yesterday there's a great scene so Brad Pitt is uh is teaching all of these uh young dated uh like MTV level uh TV show stars how to play poker in this strip club and oh, yeah. and then oh, they yeah. and they and they walk out of the they're, they're walking out of the club after Clooney has completely like stolen all of their money uh playing poker and there's there's all of this the crowd of paparazzi and fans all waiting for them Pitt and Clooney just slide right by come right up to camera to continue your scene cuz nobody cares because they don't know who Brad Pitt and George Clooney are and then like Topher Grace gets mobbed with a bunch of people because it's the guy from that 70s show, which I just find so <laughs> ironic and hilarious. Um, and the, the film is so incredibly deep. I mean, Carl Reiner, who re- just recently passed away, is like the 10th guy in this movie. And he is hysterical. And just he brings yeah, he so is. much heart and soul into this movie. And Bernie Mac is fantastic. Andy Garcia plays a terrific villain like it makes the most use out of Julia Roberts. I'm very hit or miss on Julia Roberts as an actress, but in this movie, she works because it just, it allows you as a viewer to take what you believe Julia Roberts to be and infuse it into her character to kind of reinforce like that magnetic old school chemistry uh, that makes Ocean's Eleven such a cool film. Yeah, and it's much cooler than the original Ocean's Eleven <laughs> starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and the rest of the Rat Pack. Sammy Davis. Have Jr. you seen that one? I have seen that one, and I and, and I think that film is is good for its era. It, it you know it does yeah. it does a lot of the same things that a late sixties, early seventies Bond films do in terms of action. Um, but right. like, but like the 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 point of it is still there. And what I love about this remake of that film is that the emphasis is on the celebrity status of the leading performers yep. and allowing them to be their bigger than life personas. You know, right. It's almost like let's hang out with the rat pack. Absolutely. And then at the end of the movie, they'll rob a casino. Whereas like the new one, it's more about robbing the casino, like a lot more about it, mm-hmm. but you're still essentially hanging out with like a modern day equivalent of the rat pack, like the coolest guys in Hollywood. 
Yeah. And Julia Roberts. Who is, and Julia Roberts. Who is a big, big two, even though she's not one of the 11. Right. Or is she? No, she's I not. Don't know. No, no, she's 12. Spoiler alert. <laughs> For Ocean's 12? Yeah. Did you like Ocean's 12? Yeah. That- I, I think Ocean's Twelve is incredibly underrated as a film. It's one of those yeah. Soderbergh movies there where he's where he's going back to his indie roots and trying a little things a little bit more avant garde and more European in tone. Um, and, yeah. and it doesn't have that like kind of Vegas bombastic nature. Um, it's a lot more nuanced and subtle, um, but it's doing a lot of very fun things in that movie, and I really appreciate it. But you can obviously tell that kind of some of the resistance from the hardcore fans of Ocean's Eleven are kind of like, hey you need to go back and get, get us more Vegas fun. And that's why they kind of pulled back for 13, which is a fun movie in and of itself. But like, I, I really love oceans 12 as well. The whole trilogy is fantastic. Yeah. I haven't seen oceans 12 in a long time, but I remember feeling like at the end of it, like I got conned. Yeah. Sort of, Mm -hmm. which left me feeling underwhelmed, but I do have fond memories of watching it. Cause I remember Vincent Cassell's really cool. Vincent Cassell is fantastic in that film. And you add Catherine yeah. Zeta-Jones and a, and a spoiler alert cameo from Bruce Willis. Uh, in, oh, man, I don't remember that cameo. In that film. You don't? Oh, no. man. It's my least favorite part of the film. It's, <laughs> it's Soderbergh continuing his point about celebrity status, quite honestly. Yeah. Okay. It makes more sense in that context. I, I think when I watched it, I wasn't like thinking about the movie that deeply. Right. You know, but and, uh, I, I think is. I was just like, oh, that's your play. OK, sure. Hmm. Now I want to remember this because I don't remember. OK, I don't want to spoil it for you so that it's, you know, like it surprises you gets a natural reaction when it happens. For okay, sure. Cool. Yeah. Ocean's Eleven. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Me, me too. A lot of a lot of cool dudes in suits and Brad Pitt eating and uh, super fun. I think maybe the biggest criticism I've heard of it is Don Cheadle's Cockney accent being kind of ridiculous. I, I, but I, is he a I don't know. Accent in it? Yeah, he does, but I don't care. I just think it's hilarious and fun. Yeah, and it, it, it doesn't bother me, but maybe maybe I've heard that from, you know, people from England. Yeah. Who, no, who I, are upset that that's how they look. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Number six. Number six. All right. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is the, the back half of my films is more action heavy and we're 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 right at the end of that. This is the final one that's going to be action heavy and then we'll move. Uh, into to a different kind of wave for the top five. But um, as I said earlier, I'm going to be doing a retrospective review of all of the Bond films. And part of the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm an ardent fan of both the Ian Fleming novels and the majority of these films. I own all 25 uh, that were have been made officially. And this is my Ooh. favorite one of them. So I have to put, I had to at least represent the series somewhere on that list. Um, and that is 2012's uh, Skyfall, directed by Sam Mendes. Um, nice, I, okay. I think Skyfall, and why why I picked this one over Casino Royale, which is great. Goldfinger, which I- love I, Casino Royale. Uh, Goldfinger, which I love. The old school Sean Connery. Dr. No, uh, all, the cla- mm-hmm. all the classic ones that you might think of that come to mind when you think of James Bond. Why I love Skyfall the most is not just- how technically beautiful this is with Roger Deakins' magnetic cinematography or how freaking charismatic Javier Bardem, the best Bond villain ever, is in this movie coming off of No Country for Old Men and then doing this and just kind of cementing his legacy as I am the villain badass. Um, But what I love about this is as a fan of the novels, Skyfall feels more authentic to James Bond, the character that Ian Fleming wrote, than any of the other films. He's the most vulnerable that he is in this film uh, versus every other film. He is kind of getting up there in age and dealing with, you know, moving on and trying to figure out who he is as a person beyond stealth assassin super spy. Um, And there's a lot. That's why I love Skyfall. They they really lean into Daniel Craig's age. And personal stakes. And there's a there's a mm-hmm. lot of emotion behind it. And and part of the reason for that is Sam Mendes coming from his theater background, really focusing on making sure there's like real character development uh, in this film. It's it's one of the best written uh, screenplays. It has the best Bond song, in my opinion. Adele's iconic uh, theme song from this movie is just ridiculously yeah. good and hands mm-hmm. down the best Bond song. 
Um, and then yeah, it's, it's a really good one. That's for sure. The, the acting that you get from Daniel Craig and Judy Dench and Javier Bardem just really make this movie come alive in a way that a lot of the other Bond films just never did. Although I'm going to I'm going to give you some pushback. Come on. I think my favorite Bond song is The Spy Who Loved Me. OK. <laughs> I, OK, I, I, I it's 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 I, I kind of feel that the cheese coming on a little bit with that. Like, I, oh, yeah, definitely. I, I you know, if you had said something like Diamonds Are Forever or Goldfinger, uh, like I think those are both uh, terrific options. Live and Let Die. If you want to go Paul McCartney and Wings like that works. Um, you know, Live and Let Die was my first Bond movie. So that's like the song I remember the most. Sure. You know, it's a um, weird place to enter into. It, it's, it, it is. It's a, but my dad liked the Roger Moore era. Sure. He really liked the goofier Bond. Right. And it just the way that they lean into the black exploitation in that film is 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 a little problematic. Uh, it yeah, works. it doesn't look good now. That's no, for sure. no, it certainly doesn't. And I haven't yet <laughs> gotten to Roger Moore in my uh, review retrospectives, but. Uh, part of what I'm doing, but it's not as bad as that one time Sean Connery um, became an Asian man. Yep. No, I just recently did uh, that film. Uh, uh, you is only live twice. No, no, no. That's you, no, only, you live only live twice. twice. Mm-hmm. Moonraker is a, a, a Roger Moore film. Um, um, I agree with you on Skyfall, though. I think Skyfall is quite good. Uh, I think Casino Royale is almost equally good. Yeah. Um, I really wish Spectre had turned out better, in my opinion. Um, I don't know what your opinion on Spectre is. Uh, but let me put it this way. Um, no time to die mm-hmm. might make me feel better about Spectre in retrospect if they can land it right. Absolutely. And I think I think hopefully whenever that act film actually comes out, we can have a longer, deep discussion on Daniel Craig as a Bond and just the Bond series in general uh, while talking I about think, No Time I to mean, Die. I mean, I think Daniel Craig's one of the better Bonds for sure. I like Pierce Bronson. I actually just talked about Goldfinger the other day, but I think Goldfinger is the only pierce bronson movie that i actually enjoy him at that, in bond wait you're you, that's 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 uh you're talking about golden eye goldfinger is a shot what did Kyrie. i say goldfinger yeah My bad Gold, yeah golden eye i talked about golden eye the other day yeah um i think that's probably the only pierce bronson bond i really enjoy but i like pretty much all the connery ones except for the one uh you only live twice mm-hmm. i don't i think that movie's <laughs> too yeah. too cringy no for sure that that's a that's a hard that's a hard movie to get through yeah, but Bond has never really been my thing. Like, um, it's been hard to get over the moon about any of the Bond movies that I've seen. And and right. while I like Casino Royale and I like Skyfall, I, I haven't been crazy about them. I don't know what there is for me. As like, There's just like a, well, a disconnect it, to Bond. I think look, this is my experience with Bond and kind of why I like it. And I'll be interested to see what Matt says. In my opinion... The key for truly like being into Bond is like sh- have your dad show it to you when you were a little kid. <laughs> I, I and oh, too late. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, but like he showed me Live and Let Die, and then a couple of other ones, and that's kind of how I got into it. Like he he entered me into like the corny era, like the fun, goofy era of Bond. So like I never really took it seriously. It was always just about like just f- silly fun, you know, and like spy thrilling. So. Uh, then whenever like the nineties, they started getting a little serious at first and then a little goofier near the end of the Pierce Brosnan era. And I wasn't into those at all, but then I think I got really into it with uh, Casino Royale. Cause I think Casino Royale is just a wonderfully filmed action movie. Absolutely. I, and I would agree with you on the point about your dad. So my dad introduced me to bond through honor Majesty's secret service, which is one of his favorite bond films. That's the nice, one. Yeah. That's, that's the one George Lazenby film uh, where he did a one-off when Sean Connery got tired of uh, of making Bond films after you o- you only live twice, and then Lazenby came in, did one, and then they had to bring Connery back after Lazenby quit. But yeah, the, I Bond was a was a was a series that that I started watching because my dad watched it, um, and then I never really picked it up completely until I was in college and I was home one summer and I was like, all right, let me just pound through all of these. And I just started to love the character even more. And it just started to buy the novels and got into it that way. And learning about, uh, you know, James Bond, the the character from the Ian Fleming novels. And there's a lot, you can see a lot of cinema history. If, as you go through the series, especially chronologically, you can see the stylistic changes, what was important, uh, what feels problematic now, uh, 
um, kind of how the series evolves. Um, you can you can also you can definitely tell when Dukes of Hazard came out because there's there's a Dukes of Hazard influence <laughs> in the '70s uh, with uh, with a couple of the Roger Moore films. I'm sure Mike, you you know mm. what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, you know, and it kind of just evolves and changes over the course of the series. It's part of the reason that I really like it because you always there there's so much so much of a movies don't uh, feel like they're set in a specific place, but this character feels like he can go anywhere in any era. And though while a lot of the films are set in specific time frames and are limited in by the restrictions of when they were made, um, Bond feels timeless and and Skyfall in and of, of those films feels especially timeless, mostly for how, aside from some of the technological stuff that, uh, that that's required in the plot, most of this could have happened during any era. It feels ageless. Um, and that's that's really one of the things that that sets apart Skyfall to me Um, because it feels like it could happen at any time. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Okay. So after the Craig, after Craig, uh, I assume after no time to die, after Craig hangs up his hat, Mm -hmm. I would really like to see um, the James Bond movies do something a little different, not necessarily reinvent the character or whatever, but whoever the new Bond is, I would like to see it take place in the 60s. Okay. Okay. That way you could have gadgets, you could have fun and, and goofiness. You don't have to adapt for smartphones, satellites. You can just have an old school 60s style adventure. Yeah. What do you think about that? Does, I, that, I think does that's, that sound good to you at all? I think that's fun. And I think that's I, the gadgets are interesting. What I love to see and what part of what I love about the, the Daniel Craig films is that they're not it, like it feels like real spy work a lot of the time. There's a lot yeah. of like espionage you're going in you're trying to break break into a place to get some intelligence it's intelligence gathering and trying to 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 do a lot of that sort of stuff so my personal Mm -hmm. what i would love to see from uh going forward uh with with bond i know idris elba is a very popular choice uh to to move the character forward um and i know that there's a lot of people that are up in arms about lashana lynch playing 007 and no time to die. And I'm very wait and see on that. Like, let's wait and actually see the movie before we get all up in arms about what, why would they get upset about that? Like they're not going to just like, they have to have only so many agents and they have to reuse the, uh, correct the code names, right? Correct. He quit but, at the end of Spectre. Correct. Spoilers. But, correct. But there, <laughs> it's more that it's a woman than anything else that a woman is yeah, taking on like bonds. People, people be mad about dumb stuff. I know. And that's why I'm saying I, let's wait and actually watch the movie and see what happens first. But if you're going to do a traditional hard reset, I think what your approach is probably pretty close to what I would like to see. I'm not as big on all of the gadgets. Uh, I'm kind of a, an old school minimalist in terms of gadgetry, which is part of the reason I love these Daniel Craig films so much is they're very sure. limited on the gadgetry. And I would really love to see uh, Chris Nolan take a shot at these with Tom Hardy. Like that's that's kind of my ideal director actor tom hardy that's an interesting choice i would like to see Mm -hmm. tom hardy try it but like i don't know that he wouldn't put on a goofy voice no i mean and 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 i think you wouldn't have a goofy voice when you have a director that he's worked with before so much (laughs) who has a distinct vision um and no one has you know cited the bond series as influences on his work for a very long time um and i definitely get somewhat of a bond vibe from tenet I'm kind of I, I want to see kind of what that actually rolls out to be. But like you can kind mm-hmm. of see visually, like stylistically, oh, this kind of feels like a a, a spy movie. Um, so I'm kind of I'm interested to see that kind of a take on it. But I, I feel like that pairing could work really well together on the Bond series. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. If it was Christopher Nolan, I wouldn't say do the 60s thing i'd say do whatever you want christopher nolan wait well, for the next guy who's just some for studio sure. hack to reboot it but you 60s. can but you can but you don't have to set it in the actual 60s to have a 60s vibe and i think that's i think that's, that's true. part of the success of what casino royale at skyfall is is it has a 60s flair but it's set in 2010 2011 2012 yeah i think i think that's probably right especially with casino royale because there's a lot of um tropical bright areas you know mm-hmm. and i typically associate that with like the 60s era bond when he's always going to an island or like a a beach somewhere, you know, funny, quick aside about, about Casino Royale. I always, uh, remember that movie somewhat negatively for myself because it, 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 it kind of pokes fun at me. 
Um, there's a scene early in the film where Bond has to go and steal some security tape. Um, and he goes <laughs> in and he's having to grab a Blu-ray. And Sony was the was the major producer of the Bond series at that point. They came out through Sony's studios and they kind of forced some product placement to get Blu-ray in because Sony was like the one pushing Blu-ray at the time. Right. And, I, and I had bought HD DVD when I was upgrading. <laughs> and so I had got like an HD DVD player and had all my HD DVDs and I couldn't get Casino Royale and HD DVD. It was Blu-ray exclusive. And so it like every time I see Bond going and pulling out a Blu-ray and Casino Royale, I kind of shake my fist at Sony. <laughs> Enjoy your Blu-ray, money bags. Exactly right. Yeah. And now I have like, several hundred blu-rays and 10 hd dvds maybe you could watch casino royale and the uh, the wound would be mended it's true but the born series was was hd dvd exclusive for a long time so i have all those in, in hd so DVD. that's why you chose that format <laughs> it is probably <laughs> I, I chose born over bond <laughs> wow <laughs> well there's less of them they're much yeah. easier to uh tackle the entire born oeuvre that's true especially true. back when hd dvd was an actual thing all right. Um, so you've done 10 through six. So before we go on to five through one, you just want to give us a quick recap. Sure. At number 10, Inception. At number nine, All the President's Men. At number eight, The Born Identity. At number seven, Ocean's Eleven. And six, Skyfall. Perfect. All right. All right. And number five is a film that I know Justin and I don't always agree, disagree on everything. We have widely different takes on things like Black Klansman, and a couple of other films, but Black Klansman always kind of stands out to me. I think yeah, I, was, I know. I, was, I know. I was one Believe of the. Me. I was one of the people that uh, Justin talked about reaching out to him about the Five Bloods and his relationship to Spike Lee, uh, knowing his take on uh, Black Klansman. Uh, but I know for a fact that he and I are going to agree on this film. Uh, it's one of the. I think it's the newest film on my list. Um, and uh, I'll start by by saying when I first saw this film, I went to a theater in San Antonio. I'd seen the trailer once. I knew that I was going to like it. It just at least wanted to see it based on the director and the star. And so I went in there with little expectations. I just was like, all right, let me be transported. And when I walked out of the theater, my first immediate reaction was this must be what it felt like to watch The Graduate when you when it came out and you didn't know what The Graduate was. Um, and okay, yeah. And that is the 2017 film from Greta Gerwig, Lady Bird. Nice. Oh, nice. I love this film. I think Saoirse Ronan is probably the best young actress of her generation. Uh, she holds a candle way above pretty much anybody else that you can put uh, put above, uh, you know, put, try to put all, on the same level as her. And this performance is exactly why. It's it, there's so many layers to it. You can you can see so much emotion from her as a character in her performance um, that could just be played super lazily, you know, end of, end of, end of high school films are so overdone at this point that it's rare to see one that's as genuine and authentic as this is. And it's a lot of it, it comes from both Greta Gerwig's phenomenal screenplay and Ronan's expert uh, interpretation uh, and performance of that combine that, with one of the best ensemble casts I've seen in at least five years, when you've got everybody from Lori Metcalf to Tracy Letts to Beanie Feldstein to both Timmy Sh Timothy Chalamet and Lucas Hedges in this film, um, and then there's some great smaller character parts. Uh, Steven Steven Henderson is is ridiculously good in a small part as their dra their first drama teacher um, who leaves <laughs> halfway through. Uh, in it, I love this movie so much because. It feels so authentic to my high school experience, though I never went to a all girls all, all girls Catholic school. Uh, I went to a regular public schools, but it still feels authentic to me and what I kind of lived through. You know, nothing was actually based on any reality, but there's an authenticity and genuineness to the overall film that I just love and appreciate so much. Justin, don't you agree with me? I wholeheartedly agree with you. This I, was I knew you would far, far and away my favorite film of 2017 and Greta Gerwig uh her uh, Little Women last year was far and away my favorite film uh, of that year too. And and both of those years are actually pretty good for movies. There's a lot of other good stuff giving it competition. I I think Greta Gerwig is uh, incredible and I was blown away by Lady Bird the first time I saw it. I you know, I 
I tend to gravitate more towards sort of, you know, slice of life, uh, authentic films. I think that was the word you used that I, I really like that about it because even though I have no experience with uh, Sacramento or being a girl in high school or Catholic girl school or any, anything like that, like the movie feels so genuine and it comes and it lets you in, in a way where you really understand everything. Like I, I've rarely, it's awesome how much I connect to this character when I'm, we're probably not very much alike, you know? Yeah. Uh, th- this movie's really great. I enjoy it quite a bit as well. I mean, we put out an episode on it and I think we all were pretty enthusiastic about this movie. Uh, but anyway, I interrupted you. I apologize. No, I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, going off of what Justin said, I like, I, in terms of the rela- relatability, I didn't have the same experience, uh, that lady bird does in the film. Uh, why she cries sings crash into me by Dave Matthews band. But I know growing up, I had a lot of emotional experiences listening to Dave Matthews band by myself. Um, and so like that <laughs> plays really true and authentic to me. Um, and so, so it, like th- that's, that's what's great about this film is that there's so many different little things and minor characters that make that the world is so full in Lady Bird that you don't always get from, from, uh, from dramedy like this. And it, like you, it, it's very rich uh, in that way. Well, I like how characters act in this movie. Like they act in ways where they're trying to be very cool. Yes. But like we, as people who are older than them, just kind of get to laugh at them. Yep. Right. But the characters in the movie just take themselves seriously the whole time. You know, like uh, when Lady Bird first walks up to um, Timothy Chalamet's character. Yeah. And he's like always reading a book that you always kind of suspect he's not really reading. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And he's always trying to be cool, like overly cool. Uh, I don't know. To me, like I really enjoy watching that. Mm-hmm. It's so yeah. genuine. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know what it's like watching it being closer to high school, but I, I do think that there is something you get from the film on a rewatch. You, you know, a lot of the stuff that's a little more serious or, um, some of the stuff that feels a little heavier the first time you watch it, I, I think like the second time you can find a lot more humor in it and it doesn't feel as heavy. And and I think that's part of like very similar to like when you're experiencing things as a high schooler, you're, you know, everything feels like the end of the world or like the most important thing. And, and upon looking back on your life, you can laugh at it. And I think Lady Bird kind of functions the same way, which is really cool. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it always it always feels like you're watching somebody's memories and that that you can relate to like someone is relating you an experience that has happened to them in your in their, in, in their past and so that's why it feels autobiographical for Greta Gerwig even though she says it's not um, and I think a lot of what the success of that comes from the visual style um, where where you know it's it's filmed modernly and digital film but it has like a faded quality to like the color palette. And there's, there's a little bit of haze or noise put on the actual digital thing where it makes it feel like, like a photograph in faded memory uh, when you're watching it. So like, it doesn't feel mm-hmm. as sharp, but it feels like you're watching something through, through like a, a sheet of like semi clear glass or uh, fragile paper where your, your seat has that faded quality to it that I love. And you definitely, you definitely get, uh, more impact on the mother daughter relationship on subsequent viewings. At least I did. I found more depth there after watching the whole contents of it, because I feel like the first time I watched it, I was so wrapped up in uh, Lady Bird and her relationship with Beanie Feldstein's character. And then the, the Lucas, Lucas Hedges and Timothy Chalamet characters that it really didn't resonate for me as a man, the mother daughter relationship until a subsequent viewing. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And, I think that's the thing that resonated with like my fiance at, on first viewing as, you know, as a woman, she just very much latched on to the mother daughter relationship. And that's like the things that really moved her about the film too. So it, it's cool that it works on so many levels. Absolutely. Are we ready to move on to number four? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ready All right. when you're yeah. ready. All right. So uh, I have to admit, like I, as I was getting down to finalizing this list, uh, I kind of was looking for something to to lock in my tent spot and I was going through my catalog of films here and I passed this film at number four and realized that I hadn't put it on my list at all. 
and I was like, oh God, I have to, I have to get this in this film in. I uh, immediately threw it on to watch it and I was trying to figure out where to slate it. And it ended up at number four for me. Uh, the thing that I love most about this film is just how unexpectedly brilliant it is. Uh, I, that uh, from, I, from the first time I watched it, I just remember my mind being blown in terms of just how ridiculously deep and layered this film is for being so traditional in terms of its storytelling. Um, and my favorite way to intro this film is by talking about how Quentin Tarantino had two different scripts. Then he went to Tony Scott and he said, here are the two scripts, read it, pick the one that you want. I'll make the other one. Um, and Tony Scott chose this film and then Tarantino went out and made Reservoir Dogs. Um, so my number four movie with one, one of my, probably my favorite ensemble cast uh, the most violent film on my list and the last film that has any real action in it at all. It's 1993's Tony Scott film, True Romance. That is so interesting that you said that because my girlfriend is actually watching um, The Sopranos for the first time right now. Yeah. And she's like, man, James Gandolfini is so good. And I was like, yeah, you should see him in True Romance. That's like one of the first things that I remember, like uh, he like uh, chronologically early wise that he was in. Yeah, for and, sure. Um, and she was like, okay, yeah, sure. And then I told her it was like written by Quentin Tarantino and has like a great cast. It has like Brad Pitt and James mm -hmm. Gandolfini and Gary Oldman and freaking Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette. Yeah. Uh, who that, else? There's like a million people in this there's, movie. Okay, I, I wrote down the list so so that so that in case you asked this question, I could just go through it. So Chris, <laughs> Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, Val Kilmer, Brad Pitt, James Gandolfini, Christopher Walken, Dennis Hopper, Gary Oldman, Samuel L. Jackson, Michael Rappaport, Tom Sizemore, Chris Penn, Bronson, Bronson Pinchot, Balky for Perfect Strangers is incredible in this movie too. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the scene of him uh, setting up, negotiating a Coke deal with Christian Slater on a roller coaster is probably one of my favorite <laughs> Uh, unintentional comedy scenes of all time. Just the just the way that like his eyes kind of glaze over as he's going up and down the roller coaster is just incredible to me. While you know, <laughs> Patricia Arquette's just in the back eating snacks. It's just absolutely incredible. Everything about this movie, it's very dated, but like you feel like I feel like I'm watching Quentin Tarantino's real life or what he wants his real life to be like in Christian Slater's character. Cause it's just like a nerd who likes reading comics and going to watch Kung Fu movies and just really wa wants a, an attractive girl to just be like, I'll fall in love with you and have sex with you all the time. And we can go on wild and crazy adventures. And that just happened. Um, and that's kind of where this movie all kind of takes off from, but it includes some of the best dialogue, the best, you know, two handed scenes. There's a scene between Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken where they're talking about, um, uh, Italians and and where Sicilian yeah. blood comes Sicilian from. Sicilian heritage. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. that that scene in and of itself is one of the most underrated scenes ever. Because you know when I when I tell people that are just starting to get into like small, not traditional big box office, but just like small random fodder, uh, they're like, oh, I really love Pulp Fiction. What else should I watch? And I go, well, if you love Pulp Fiction, you should watch True Romance. Like, Tarantino wrote it, and I think it's as good. It, a good of a script as Pulp Fiction. Like some of the, you know, Pulp Fiction's a better movie objectively, but True Romance is more of a cult classic favorite. And I prefer watching True Romance to Pulp Fiction just because I love all of the diff different little layers in True Romance more than I do Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I can hear the music for True Romance right now in my head. For sure. I I heard the music from True Romance earlier today, actually. Do you uh, know? I won't, I'll, I'll keep it spoiler free as to why, but. Do you, uh, do you Mike, Mike, you'll find out later. Do okay. you know who wrote the music for this? And I, I was stunned. I just re I just learned this today. Do you know whose score that is? No, it's no, Han even though I played it on Spotify, it's Hans Zimmer. I, it, it blows my mind that Hans Zimmer <laughs> did the music for this. Like I, I would not expect Hans Zimmer to have made that kind of music, but it makes so much sense. And it's like, it's, it's, it is so catchy. Like you could hear it anywhere and it would just be like, ah, oh, this is a Quentin Tarantino jam. If you've seen um, Terrence Malick's Badlands, you know where they got a lot of like that score from, yeah. or like that yeah. opening music uh, where that influence was from. For sure. <laughs> what well, if uh, I actually saw an interview with Quentin Tarantino one time about this movie, and he was saying that uh, 
he was really excited that Tony Scott was going to film his movie because he really, really liked, um, uh, what's that? Oh, revenge with yeah. Kevin Costner. Yeah. And, um, Tony Scott also did that movie. And so he was really excited that Tony Scott was going to be the guy to do his movie, you know? And he said that, uh, like, you know, remember in the movie, Christian Slater is doing a triple feature of, um, street fighter, return of street fighter. Yes. The, the, mm-hmm. the Sonny Chiba. Says- Sunny yeah. Chiba movies. Sunny movies? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. And anyway, it's like a triple feature on the marquee of a theater. And then Quentin Tarantino said that he had friends, like other fellow movie nerds that got really excited when they saw that. And then they got equally pissed when they realized it was just Quentin's stupid movie being filmed. <laughs> and that they didn't actually get to go see a triple feature of Street Fighter. That's funny. And I always thought that story was funny. Yeah, but I'm sure that yeah. you can watch that at the new Beverly sometime. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, but but I, at the time, the New Beverly was not Quentin Tarantino. For sure. Playhouse. That's true. But yeah, I'm totally with you on this movie. I think it probably is my favorite like Tarantino m- movie. Like, Obviously, he didn't direct it, but like, in, just in terms of... It's my favorite thing to come from Tarantino, right? This script and, and this movie. Uh, I, I really am, am partial to like a romance movie and like rom-coms. And uh, there's just something so lovable about... Uh, Clarence in Alabama. Yes. And in and, and this movie that I, I just really enjoy watching them. It's got a lot of like Tarantino staple dialogue. And I like seeing it in the hands of someone else. And then also to have the movie just be a, a little bit more on the sweeter side and somehow balancing the sweetness with the violence. Uh, and um, I, what, I really Jackie love Brown? this Are you movie describing Jackie Brown? Huh? What? <laughs> Jackie Brown's not that violent though. I mean, it's not, not that violent. But Jackie Brown is sweet too. I'm 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 with you. This one's a I'm, little more, a little more. This one's a little more. I guess nerdy. typical typical of the, the violence and the the film nerd outness right. of it. But I, I really like this movie a lot. It is it's fantastic. Yeah, I think for the record, Jackie Brown's a better script. But um, this movie's a lot more watchable. I guess like Jackie Brown's like a, I have to clear an evening and like. Because I love Jackie Brown, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Um, this movie is like, uh, I agree. This movie is really fun. And I think the cast and the characters and the kind of the, the corniness of it, like Tony Scott, like is kind of a corny filmmaker in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it that dated early 90s, late 80s feel this movie has um, is a lot of fun. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it would, I would watch this before I would rewatch Reservoir Dogs. Oh, or, for sure. Yeah. Like half of Quentin Tarantino's movies, for sure. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You could throw on this movie it, at any point and I would watch the entire rest of the movie. No matter <laughs> if it was 20 minutes in or an hour in, I would still immediately sit down and finish watching this movie. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. Great choice. Thank you. If you liked that, Justin, I know you will like my number three pick because I feel like you and I are in agreement on this film. Um, <laughs> this is a film that I've seen... <sighs> I think I saw this. This is the one I saw the most in theaters. I feel like I saw this film eight or nine times in theaters. Um, and part of that was because I was running a movie theater at the time and could watch it, you know, by myself or whenever I wanted uh, in in the in a theater. So I had the opportunity. Um, but I love this film for so many different reasons. The number one reason being every single time I watch this movie, I find myself loving a different part or loving a different character. Um you know, there's so many different things that make this 2016 film my my number three movie. Um, and I'm not going to delay it anymore and we can get in and really talk about it. It's uh, the Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling 2016 classic La La Land. I absolutely adore this film. Um, I know that the, the people who don't love musicals will probably not be as big of fans of La La Land as I am. But to me, it's not about the singing. It is about the music, but to me, it's not about the singing. Um, and I can make some arguments with people about why uh, I, I've had people that are really into to musical theater and Broadway saying they should have cast better singers than Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. I, I think it, it, it works perfectly. Um, but like to me, it's about the emotion and the passion that you get from both of their performances. It's a love letter to Hollywood. It's a love letter to L.A., it's a star crash romance from two people who shouldn't be together, but get together in the most magical way. Justin Hurwitz's score is incredible. The performances are fantastic. 
Um, you know, I, I found myself identifying with Emma Stone so much for the first four or five viewings and just really not liking Ryan Gosling's character. And then, you know, all of a sudden you can start you, it, the next watch. You instantly you're like, oh, it makes so much sense. Like, I, I, I get it now. Um, every everything, even down to like John Legend coming in, it's exactly the right amount of use of a, a singer who can't exactly act. Uh, he, he's really great in this movie. There's so many of those small little things that are fantastic and just the bright pops of color that come in uh, that really make this film fun and vibrant um, and so influenced by so many different things from jazz music to French cinema to all sorts of different uh, things. La La Land is something that I could walk, put on five days in a row and find 10 different things that I love about it. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'll, I'll let y'all hop in on the fun. <laughs> Mike, do you want to go first or you want me to gush about La La Land? Yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I really love this movie from the first time that I saw it. Uh, it. It feels like a movie that someone somehow was watching in on my life and was like, I'm going to make a movie for that guy. Yeah. Right. Like it touches on a lot of the musical influences. I love a lot of the film uh, uh, influences that I like. I'm really in like, I like jazz music. I think it's super fun. And like, I like listening to it. I don't listen to it every day or like obsessed with it. Like Ryan Gosling does, but I do enjoy it. And to have this sort of musical that's very jazz based uh, was awesome. I listened to the soundtrack, you know, I listened to it over and over again, right after I saw the movie and I, I know, I think I've only seen the movie like three times, but I know the movie so well because I've listened to the soundtrack so much because it's just catchy and awesome. And yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know that there's just a more recent movie I can think of that's just more straight up fun than this. And like, yes, there's tragic elements to it, but they also feel tragic in a sort of Hollywood movie kind of way. And it's, it's a very much an escapist film for me. And I, I do gravitate towards more escapism and, um, you know, that uh, slice of life stuff, as I mentioned as well, but uh, escapism is one of the things I really value in a movie, which is why I love things like true romance uh, as well. <laughs> and yeah, this movie is just like pure escapist fun. And I, I really love it. Yeah, when I first think of this movie, the thing that comes to mind the most is colors. Yep. Like, I think yeah. of colors. I think of yellow dresses and red dresses and blue, the color blue. <laughs> like Purple yeah. skies. <laughs> yeah, Purple skies. it's like, the it's a visual treat to watch. Mm-hmm. Like, every scene, it just pops. It looks good. Like, it's like pastel colors, really pretty, vibrant stuff. Um, the performances, I think, are both really good. The singing, it doesn't really, I don't have opinions on whether or not they should or should not have been cast. I think their performances are good. I especially think Emma Stone is really good. Um, This movie does not work without her, in my opinion, uh, honestly, because she has like these these, these big, bright eyes, like this new up and coming kind of face, you know, and it works because that's what she was doing at the time. Like she was just starting to bloom out on the scene and be cast in everything by everybody. And so it has this really like, you're watching it and, and you're like, yeah, of course, she's destined to be a star. Why not? Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. She's Emma Stone. But I think, and and I, I want to be kind of vague here. My one complaint about this movie that stops me from completely loving it is I feel like Ryan Gosling's character arc is a little like an afterthought. And and we can cut this if you guys think. But um, like for the whole movie, he's trying to build a jazz club. Right. And then, like, the whole movie is like, no one listens to jazz. It's not going to work. But then at the end, it just does for some reason. Like, did he somehow make people more interested in jazz? Well, no, it, it, it's no different than, oh, she lands a random audition. And then she immediately, uh, from, from a terrible uh, one-woman show, lands an audition and then becomes this... Uh, New, yeah, that, new, that, new, you know, Judy Garland esque character overnight. Right, and I think I think that's what stops me from completely loving it. Like, I still think it's an exceptional movie, and I think you're absolutely right to have it on here. But my one thing that keeps me from loving it is at the end, it, where everything when they're about to do what they're going to do, and like, yeah, her one woman show, 
and then his jazz club, two things that like really like I don't necessarily believe that they would be successful based on those two failures. You know what I mean? Those two dreams. Yeah. I, I feel like that's a comment on the way that Hollywood can work. Like you get the right audition, the right chance. You, you know, there is that whole number with Emma Stone getting ready to go to the party. And it's like, you never know this like one night, one chance right. meeting could set you off. And that's kind yeah. of what happens to her character. Yeah. I, I, hers is less of a problem, but with him, yeah. I was really just like, cause the whole movie, it was almost like a guaranteed, like given fact that he needed to get his head out of the clouds because jazz would not work. It's not like monetarily uh, feasible. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I never all felt it that it, I guess I never felt that it was necessarily wildly successful so much as that he just finally accomplished his dream you know well, regardless I guess, like, of whether or not go, it's super lucrative yeah it, it appeared to be based on what we see but i don't want to get into too many fine sure. details on it but yeah <laughs> sure, great sure, movie sure. i i think the scene that uh, sticks out to me the most my favorite scene in the movie is i don't even remember the name of the song but it's like when she first goes to the party and she's walking through and the music gets really low and she's walking through the party and it's like blue and then the music starts to rise. Uh, yeah, it's like someone in the crowd is. Yeah, the, I don't know if that's the name of the song, but that's like the the kind of hook chorus line. Yeah, yeah, and as the music starts to rise and get more energetic, and like the people just jump off the balcony or whatever into the pool. Yeah, that's someone um, in the crowd. Yeah, that's yeah. my favorite sequence of the movie. It was just like this is just a joy for my eyes and ears right now. Yeah, as anyone who listened to my top ten episode would note, "Singing in the Rain" was mm -hmm. uh, my number one film. And I have, so the, the scene obviously that sticks out to me that I just cherish and love to death <laughs> and was just like smiling ear to ear when I first saw it is like when, um, Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, when they leave the party and like he walks, they walk, um, out towards her car and they do the sort of like Gene Kelly esque tap dance number. Uh, yeah, on you the, can see the them road. head to toe. Yeah. And that's just my favorite far and away. <laughs> It's it's mine as well, and I, I it's it's not as much because of the Gene Kelly singing in the rain. I just love the artistry of that how that scene was constructed, uh, and the way that the camera moves so fluidly in and out. And it's all one take that they shot, all all in one take. They basically had two two shots a day at filming that scene all at once uh, to try to get the right mood light, to try to get the right natural lighting because some of this film, mm -hmm. so much of this film is done in natural light. Um, and just the artistry that that takes and the coordination between the performers and the, the crew to kind of get everything in sequence and have it work so majestically and perfectly like that is expert filmmaking that just is it, it, it cements the rubber stamp for me like this is high quality cinema. Yeah, oh, yeah. it feels meticulous for sure and, and not necessarily in a way that punches you in the face where you're you're spending the whole time appreciating the shot right. Oh no, I don't. Like, I don't think if you saw showed it to a random person that they would recognize it as one shot. Well, cool. I I, I love that choice. <laughs> Thank you. I I I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna also uh, get you on my side again uh, by uh, delving into your love for romantic comedies with my number two selection. Um, to me, this is the best romantic comedy of all time. It's one of the best scripts of all time. Um, and it has one of my all-time favorite comedic performances in it. Um, I, what I love so much about this film is just how every single scene, no matter what mood I'm in, I will always find myself laughing at at least five different things, three of which a normal person wouldn't laugh at. Um, but I've, loved, I've seen this movie so many times, and I forget that I own it sometimes. It's my catcher in the rye in a way where I like, Oh, I see a copy of it on Blu-ray. I need to buy that right now. Ooh, here's an anniversary edition. Let me grab that. So like in my life, <laughs> I've probably had like 10 copies of this and so much so that I have to like give a copy to somebody else and be like, hey, I have four of these. Here, you, ha you haven't seen this in a while. Take it. Here, you can have it. Um, and that that is the uh, 1989 Rob Reiner classic When Harry Met Sally with Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan. Nice. Classic. Yep. Yeah, so good. This is one of my favorite rom-coms too. Yeah, no, I, I love everything about When Harry Met Sally from Nora Ephron's pitch perfect script to how Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan are able to make the most out of every single word, um, the way that they inflect different things for different points. 
and different points of view. It's Bill. It's my favorite Billy Crystal performance ever in anything. I think he's better in this than he is in City Slickers or you know Throw of Mama from the Train or anything. This is hands down the best Billy Crystal performance all time. Better than him at the Oscars. I love Billy Crystal in this movie. Um, him. <laughs> I just and, love Billy Crystal. Him and Bruno Kirby at the Giants game doing the Mr. Zero bit uh, while they're doing the wave and he's talking about how his wife is leaving him is one of my favorite all-time scenes. I just, I, I find myself in stitches rolling on the floor every time I watch that scene because it just, the the depression on Billy Crystal's face and Bruno Kirby just not understanding any of that is just so impeccable to me. And I love the the choice that they, that Kreiner uses to infuse all of the, like the documentary style uh, footage of the different couples talking about how they fell in love to kind of like balance out the different eras of Harry and Sally's romantic journey from they hate each other. Do they like each other? Do they love each other? Um, it, it mm-hmm. It's just, it's so great. And it's a very small film and it focuses on two people, but like Carrie Fisher is ridiculously good in this movie. She's better than yeah. she is in a lot of star Wars in, in, you know, in the, in this film uh, just with, just with her perfect timing and the way that, she's able to to banter with Meg Ryan just so perfectly. And it, it it's 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 an absolutely fantastic film. It's an all time classic for me. It's what I think of when I think of 80s movies like, oh, want to watch a movie from the 80s? Sure. Let's watch When Harry Met Sally. It's it is that movie to me. Um, that is that that defines the eight that entire decade to me is When Harry Met Sally. It's my favorite romantic yeah. comedy, one of my favorite John genres. That's 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 why I love When Harry Met Sally. Solid choice. I think my favorite Carrie Fisher performance is in The Burbs. Oh, I thought you were going to say Blues <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> nope, The Burbs. I love The Burbs. Yeah, she's actually, a, I think, a really great comedic actress. And it's so weird, you know, that she's she's so well known for Star Wars, where she's not particularly funny and is pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. Because an- another thing that I really love her in is her, her episode of 30 Rock that I've watched recently, um, which, you know, she's a lot older in it. And I think there's some that, you know, ideas, at least like with the newer star Wars films that she's lost to her touch as an actress. And maybe I think in she's films, great she, in the last Jedi. She is great. True. in the Last Jedi. She, she is really good. That, that's a, that's a good point. Um, maybe it was, maybe I'm thinking more of so like force awakens, but she's really great in 30 rock. Really funny. She's really funny in this movie too. So, uh, you're, you're spot on. Justin, what is your favorite scene in when Harry met Sally? If I could put you on the spot. Oh man. Um, I'll buy you some time. Don't, don't do that to me because I won't be able to name one. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't seen it in a very, 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 very long time. You're okay. Oh, oh, it's the, uh, it's, I think, are they at a museum or are they just walking through a park and they do the, the, the poppy cash pepper paper? They're in a museum. (laughs) Paper and poppy cash. Yeah. Yeah. I love that scene. Like Billy Crystal is so charming and they're, they're like chemistry right there. Like I just buy every second of like them being goofy with each other and it doesn't feel forced, even though that moment very easily could. Yeah. I wonder if you could put Billy Crystal in anything with anyone and he could not have chemistry with someone. Yeah, that may be fair. I mean, even his one scene in Spinal Tap is like so like could be throwaway and it just really works and really feels good because he's he's great. Um, I, I watched this movie I th- I think it's kind of been like a every other New Year's Eve. Uh, my fiance and I watch this movie. Makes sense. It's kind of the pace we've set because yeah, there there are things that happen in this movie on New Year's Eve. I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but um, yeah, it's it's become a bit of a tradition. And the sad part about that tradition is we don't really watch it any other time than New Year's Eve. <laughs> and uh, I would like to watch it more. But I I love films that are just have really great scripts and and. It's two characters talking, you know, like um, the before trilogy, Richard Linklater's before trilogy. I right. really enjoy all of those movies. Um, and uh, my dinner with Andre is another example of like two people just talking the whole time. I I'm really into those movies when they're done really, really well. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Pulp Fiction is, is a good example of that. In a lot of the movies, there's a lot of great, like a couple of characters talking scenes of it. And this movie is a, a movie that's like primarily a bunch of conversations between two people and uh, it just it just works from start to finish love it all right time for moment of truth time for number one. one. Oh my gosh all right 
I, I feel like of these, this is going to be the one that this is one of the ones that I'm more nervous about. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've gotten on a good track with Justin. I'm a little nervous about this one. Um, <laughs> but four for four out of your last, I know the, right? the top five. <laughs> I know. So uh, I had a good run going with Mike in the back half. We, we were talking about, we were really action heavy talking about all the great, you know, Christopher Nolan and Ocean's 11. And now, now, now I'm kind of in the part where I'm kind of nervous that I'm going out on a limb, but I don't mind because this is by far my favorite film of all time. Uh, and, and, and just objectively, like, I don't care. This is my favorite film of all time. Uh, That's how it needs to be. Yeah. <laughs> so what I love about this film, uh, I think as Justin noted, like screenplays is, is very important. And like, this is my favorite screenplay ever. I, I, I just, I love natural dialogue that feels fresh and authentic and, and really just like in the moment and perform really well by talented actors that know what they're doing, that are committed to every scene. Um, the directorial choice for this film is so incredibly strange, but in the strangeness, like I found a deeper appreciation for everything about this movie. Um, it's my, it's my favorite performance by one of my favorite actors uh, in Matt Damon. I, I love uh, his chemistry uh, with Minnie Driver. I love his chemistry with Ben Affleck. Uh, I love the kind of ensemble group feel that you get. And hands down, unquestionably, the greatest performance in Robin Williams history. My number one film is 1997's Gus Van Zandt film, Good Will Hunting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I obviously figured it out partway yeah. through your explanation. Um, yeah, me too. But I still have to, you know. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But it's... I didn't necessarily see this film coming. Um, it's one yeah. I've only seen once around the time it first came out, and I was way too young to like appreciate it. Yeah, you know, sure. I think I've I watched it. it with a parent. Yeah, I've seen it twice, and I will say that Robin Williams is is key to this movie. Absolutely, in my opinion. Absolutely. Oh, Robin- the scene where they're sitting there talking, and he's talking about how uh, it's like the little things that you miss. Like mm-hmm. his, he was talking about his dead wife. Yes. And the scene where they talk about how, uh, what, like she farted in her sleep, but then like, she would wake herself up. Yeah. Yeah. She woke herself up, but he didn't have the courage to like tell her or he didn't, (laughs) he didn't have like the heart to like let her know that she farted. Yeah. And they both just crack up at that scene and they, and they start to bond over it. And it's just such a genuine moment. Like Robin Williams has this thing that can just cut to the straight soul of tragedy and honesty and he can just make you cry. He can make you laugh. Robin Williams was this, this unique presence that's just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I miss him. 100%. I agree. And that, and you're absolutely right. He is what drives this movie. This movie does not work without him being so aggressive in scenes with Stellan Skarsgård where he needs to like push to fight mm-hmm. for the Will Hunting character, but so just like genuinely, like emotionally there for Matt Damon in some of, you know, in some tragic scenes like that could have been horribly misplayed uh, in different hands, but like he has the pulse of every single beat uh, as he's guiding Will's character through uh, this, um, these emotional times in his life. So the, the basic premise behind uh, Robin Williams' character is that He's the psychiatrist that has to help uh, Will through some emotional issues that he has so that he can be one of the world's great mathematicians. Uh, The the basic premise of the film is that Matt Damon plays a guy who works as a janitor at MIT, but can, but is smarter than everybody at MIT and kind of uh, has a, has a genius brain for, for mathematics, um, but has all of these issues from growing up in foster care in Boston um, and I love so many of the little things about Boston in this movie. Boston's one of my favorite uh, places to watch movies in uh, as, as a setting that, you know, you've got everything from like the departed to the town to, to the verdict uh, to, to this movie. Like I love gone, watching, baby gone, gone, baby gone. I love watching so many different films set in Boston because you can feel the city's presence in the movie at all times and not just because somebody's using an accent that sounds different and authentically of that place 
but that like it feels like a, a place with a mentality that drives character and that you can see within everybody's performance, especially in uh, the relationship between Ben Affleck and Matt Damon in the film, where Ben Affleck is a lot more blue collar, old school, like born and raised, going to die in the same home he, he, he was born in, uh, Boston guy versus Matt Damon. Hey, you need to go out in there into the world and take the world by storm and show him who Boston really is uh, character. Uh, I love so much about that. And that's what makes... Gus Van Zant such a strange choice to direct this film because uh, he does things that you don't expect in what could tra- is traditionally like a comedic drama. Uh, there's a there's a scene early in the film where where Will and his group of his band of buddies, which includes both uh, Casey Affleck and Ben Affleck, uh, Casey barely was anybody when this movie came out. They get out they get out of their car. Uh, they pull over on the side of the uh, the road and get into a fist fight with some guys that they, that, that they've had beef with on a basketball court. And that fight that could take like three seconds takes a good three minutes because guess Van Zant is doing slow motion, moving the camera around with orchestral music and, and different lighting and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> so like really put his weird, like this is a Gus Van Zant movie spin on, on a, on a traditional story, but it just works. Something about that just works for this specific film. Um, and I, all of the performances are great in it. I don't particularly like Minnie Driver as an actress, but I love her in this movie. Uh, there's a scene where she tells a joke uh, in the bar uh, that that just stuns me every time. It, 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 I'm not going to spoil it because you, you should just listen to it because that joke is one of the funniest things uh, that I've heard in a movie in uh, 10 years at least. Um, and then there's I, there's so many just iconic, just like riff off monologues um, that happen in this film uh, that I, just, I was about I to just, say, you know, if nothing else, if you haven't seen this movie, you've seen it spoofed. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Like Jay and Silent Bob. I'm thinking of Community season yep. three mm-hmm. when one of the characters is like um, he's going to college, but he also has like a, a really um, natural calling to being a plumber. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so the plumbers are trying to get him to like drop out of school and pursue his uh, the real life of being a plumber. And it's just like the opposite of the actual movie. So silly. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one that I, I, I want to watch again, uh, especially now, because I, I don't even remember the, when the last time I watched this movie was. Um, it was at least five or six years ago. But I, th- I think as I get older, I connect more and more to this type of movie. For sure. And, and I think that everything I remember about the movie just sounds like something I would love. Although my experience of remembering watching it was like a film that I liked, but did not love, but you know, it's, it's so, it's such a highly sung movie. You know, there's so many people who love it. Uh, I I think you might be the second person I know that, that this is like without a doubt their number one favorite film. So this is kind of rocketed up my list of I should rewatch this soon and, and reevaluate. This is one where I also I can't think about the name too hard. No, because then I'm like, really, they're just saying like, you're good, Will Hunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, th- this movie was not necessarily what I thought it was about when I agreed to watch it the first time when it had like recently come out. Yeah, because I was like, hunting, okay, Goodwill, all right. I shop there sometimes for clothes. Right, <laughs> you know. I, I, right. look, I look at Not it. Really. Like, I didn't really think it was about Goodwill. <laughs> that was the store. <laughs> well, it, I do feel like that, that you're on the right track there. When I when I, I think about it, you almost need to add a comma after Will. So you're looking for Goodwill. You know what I mean? You're hunting for yeah. for like some, some genuineness, some Goodwill. Um, and that kind of was where the double entendre within the uh, the the name of the, of the film kind of comes from. One of the things that I love about this film is just how unlikely it is. Um, Rob Reiner kind of helped this thing get along because the original script was twice as long as this. And on the back yeah. half, on the back half, Will Will becomes like a CIA agent, and there's like a whole yeah. like heist action sequence that, that filled the back half of this movie. And he's and, it's like half a beautiful mind. <laughs> exactly. And then and and Rob Reiner's like, no, just cut it off right there. And just, I thought it was you know, William Goldman that did that. Well, I think that's I, a that was a big rumor, but I don't know if it's I don't think it's ever been confirmed. I, okay, because I, I remember we, we had this book in college called like um, "Which Lie Did I Tell," mm-hmm. and 
William Goldman actually talks about how he he read the script for Goodwill Hunting, but didn't actually contribute to it. He just gave them some advice of what to cut. Yeah. Well, and 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 uh, and I think that was part of it. Uh, I think uh, Harvey Weinstein ended up sending the the uh, Matt Matt Damon and Ben Affleck to to Goldwyn for advice and maybe some rewrites uh, at one okay. point after he picked it up. But Rob Reiner was highly influential on that film, and I think helped pair uh, Damon and Affleck with with Weinstein, if I remember correctly. It's been some time since I've listened to the. I mean, that makes sense because they the were commentary. nobodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's no way they could have gotten Weinstein's attention. No. Uh, at that point in their careers, I, they, I think yeah. they were trying to get into Castle Rock uh, to to uh, to do the film to the film with Reiner's company, and then it just okay. somehow ended up at, at Weinstein that kind of pushed all the way for a best screenplay and best supporting actor win at the Oscars. Yeah, yeah. and Rob Reiner. I mean, say what you will about what the things that he does now, yeah. or you know the films that he's made of recent times, but like he's got a lot of great movies and did some really great stuff at this time. So it makes sense that he was involved. Yeah. And this movie turned out well. Yeah. Solid choice. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So it's a handsome top 10. Want to go over it again? Sure. So number 10 inception, number nine, all the president's men, number eight, the born identity, number seven, oceans 11, number six, skyfall, number five, Ladybird. Number four, True Romance. Number three, La La Land. Number two, When Harry Met Sally. And number one, Goodwill Hunting. Nice. Very yeah. nice. And um, real quickly, do you want to go over like some honorable mentions? We're kind of we're running pretty long here. So no, sure. I can, you know, go, like, I can go quickly. Let's go through them. I, 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 at first, the first thing I thought was that I didn't have enough diversity in terms of like, you know, stylistically, I, 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 there was a lot of sameness to it. So I was, I was trying to find some like things that I love. There were different genres or maybe from different points sure. of view. So like, uh, I want, I, I desperately wanted to get a documentary on there, but couldn't. So that my documentary choice would be man on wire, uh, which is a, which is an absolutely oh. terrific film about the, uh, the guy that did the tightrope walk across the twin towers in New York. Um, uh, I, I, yeah. I, I, we, we talked in on the podcast about another one of my favorite films, the most violent year. Um, I love the town. Uh, I love Tinker Taylor soldier spy. I'm a big fan of whiplash cause I love Damien Chazelle. Uh, and then uh, some other things for to, to get a little more diversity in there that I was thinking of in terms of directorially. Uh, I love Barry Jenkins. If Beale street could talk. Uh, I'm a big fan more recently of, uh, Melina Matsukas uh, queen and slim. Uh, which is kind of like a Bonnie oh, and Clyde that. style uh, thriller. Um, and then um, I, I think I, I mentioned this to Justin before, like my Spike Lee, modern Spike Lee, you haven't seen this, but you might want to give this one a shot pick. And that's Chirac, uh, which is kind of more of like a hip hop elegy. Elegy, is that, am I saying that right? Elegy, elegy? Elegy, uh, yeah. Elegy, elegy, yeah. Elegy, yeah, it's a hip hop elegy about... Um, life uh in the ghettos of, of chicago and gang violence um but it's set through uh, a greek tragedy uh where uh women in sparta and uh i can't remember the other um old greek town there's a there's an old tale that the women in those two towns got together to end the bloodshed by refusing to have sex at all until the until the men stopped the fighting and so chirac is about a a, a, a strike among all the women in Chicago to end the violent, the get the bloodshed and the gang violence. Um, and I, I that's, it, it's a strange movie, but I, it, I think it pairs really well with both black Klansmen and defied bloods kind of almost as like a spike Lee political trilogy about hey, race relations in America. Um, and I, and I said that on our five bloods episode. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Same page. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good. Well, some, cool. Those are some good honorable mentions. I like that. Thanks man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the ones I've seen, uh, I like. So, what's the we um, the movie version of Man on a Wire with Joseph Gordon-Levitt? What was well, that called? It's called The Walk. The Walk. That's it. Okay. Yeah, it's a Robert Zemeckis film. I like that movie. Um, but part of the reason I liked it so much is I got to see it in IMAX 3D, and that really mm-hmm. took advantage of the feeling of you being up there. Um, yeah. But it so it doesn't hold up as well on a home viewing. Um, and so much of that film is the preamble and you really just want to get up to the part where you get to see him like up there in, in the, on the Heights. Um, so it doesn't work as well. It's kind of like that movie Everest from a couple years ago 
kind of same stylistic. It's same stylistically where it ta- where it's like, hey, we have this IMAX 3D movie where you can see what it's like to be like on a thriller up in top on the top of Everest, um, based on the true story. It's uh, based on the John Krakauer novel Into Thin Air. Um, <laughs> it's a good movie with Josh Brolin, um, but it just doesn't. I was just the- thinking. It I was hold- thinking it was going to be like a more modern day version of Vertical Limit. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's based. It's based on a true story. Um, so it, it it it's more plotting and biographical uh, in style than than something like Vertical Limit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Funny story about the the walk trailer. Really quickly, uh, I have a very bad fear of heights, and I get very vertigo ish and like Ooh. panicky when I'm when I'm up high, and. I went in, I think I went to see, uh, whatever the last Hobbit movie was called. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember. It's finally over. Fi- no, something, the five armies battle, battle for the five armies, something like that, what, whatever it is. And I know it is I, the third, fi- <laughs> the third Hobbit movie. It's finally done. You're done. <laughs> there it is. Stop. You nailed it. But I went to see, uh, the third Hobbit movie. It's finally done in IMAX, uh, 3d. And so I had like 3d glasses and it was like, it was very loud, big screen, obviously. And I was like, I was like, or it said, you know, put your glasses on for the next trailer. And I put it on. It was the trailer for the walk. Yeah. And you by the end of up? the trailer, I didn't throw up, but by the end of the trailer, I was dizzy. I felt nauseous. And like, I started to have a panic attack kind of. Yeah. So I just had to, I just had to leave <laughs> and get my money back for the, for the movie. And I was like, <laughs> I just, I can't. I can't sit. So I've never seen the, the uh, Hobbit three. It's finally over actually because of that, that trailer. Oh, well it <laughs> ends finally. Um, that's funny. <laughs> I, I just like to think that like, as soon as the, it comes on and you put your glasses on, like the very first shot of like looking down, you just throw up. Oh, it, it wasn't too, that's not too far from reality. <laughs> or just fall out of your chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I could laugh now, but man, it, well, it, that messed get, with me. So I passed did, on the movie. Did you get that feeling whenever we saw um, Mission Impossible Fallout in theaters in IMAX? I I started to. Yeah, me too. For some reason, that wasn't as bad, and it wasn't not as Fallout. Like, um, Ghost Protocol. My bad. Ghost, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the the uh, tower sequence or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I started to for like a bit, but then the movie kind of moves on from those type of shots. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't quite as. Did we, was it three D? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also wasn't 3D, so it didn't have that weird effect. <laughs> cool. Anyways. Well, you've done it, uh, Matt. You've done your top 10 films of all time. I know it's kind of stressful to like put it together, but now that it's behind you, how do you feel? I, I feel good. Uh, I, I, I've spent enough time working on it that I feel like it's it's a good complimentation of every everything that I love where I don't feel so bad about leaving something out. Um, yeah. You've got yeah. romance. You've got action. Yeah. You've got drama. Mm-hmm. You got it all covered. I think so, for the most part. Cool. So uh, then I guess that does it for this episode then. All right. I believe so. It's a little bit long. So uh, thank you for sticking it out to the end. Uh, Matt, if they want to reach out to you, talk about these movies or follow your work. One more time, where could they reach out to you at? Sure. So I'm not on social media this year, uh, but you can uh, contact me Smart at move. cinematicconsiderations.com. Uh, my contact information is there or cinematicconsiderations at yahoo.com. Uh, you can also uh, try to check out uh, Hill Country Film Festival and Lone Star Film Festival. I'll be programming for those. Awesome. Very good. Well, well we appreciate thanks. you coming on. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to fill in whenever uh, Chris decides that he wants to watch a movie instead of be on the podcast. (laughs) That's true. Well, yeah, thanks for being here. And of course, uh, to the listener, thank you so much for listening. And then as always, thank you, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you do want to hear more of his music, you can go to soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. All right, stay tuned to this feed. Our next episode will be a casually criterion episode on the third film in the Apu trilogy, Apur Sensor. I don't know how to say that. Apur Sensor. Probably close enough. Yep. Sounds good to me. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thanks again for joining us, Matt. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Take it easy. You can say bye to Matt if you oh. want, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Yeah. No, no pressure or anything. No, I, I, that's fine. See you later, guys. <laughs>